You don't want to become uh, old, rich, and useless. And this is my life, and uh, this is what I do best. Roger, what did you do? <laughs> For that rotter, Freddy. I think he enjoyed spending the money. Yeah, I went to uh, Monaco with Roger, and we finished up in prison. I mean, where's the modesty gone? Well, there isn't any. There's no modesty whatsoever. You can't just sit, sit on this and, and do nothing. It's the worst thing possible. It's, it's sort of quite big. It's sort of cinema wide screen cinema scope. I'd like to have known John Lennon actually because I, I thought he was uh, a brilliant man who really did make some contribution. I always thought of myself as more of a musician than just being a drummer. Very trendy drummer, you know, hey, the good looking drummer. I think I've had some marijuana when I was a student. I think that's the first time I remember. I didn't, didn't agree with me at all. I didn't, couldn't handle it. I still can't. I think I had to go and sit down on a seat in a park because I thought my brain was on fire and, uh, and I never liked this stuff. Can I spent more time in the bathroom with their drummer. No kidding. And I think... A lot of drugs with him. Wow. <laughs> How's he doing? Oh, he's doing great. Oh, good. That's good. Live with your memories and keep them as memories and that's great. Forget the bad time. Roger Meadows Taylor was born on 26th of July, 1949 in Kings Lee. Later, he and his family moved to Truro, Cornwall. When he was seven years old, he and some friends formed his first band, the Bubbling Over Boys, in which he played the ukulele. He then, at the age of 13, he joined Truro School as a day boy. At the age of 15, Taylor became a member of the Reaction, a very busy semi-pro rock band formed by mainly of boys from Truro School. The reactions got the chance to record in the studio, backing up Johnny Quayle on four songs. The performances were very good, and at the end of the session, which was done in either one or two takes, whoever was recording them came up and said to them, Slip us 20 pounds and you can make a 45 record. So, on the spot, they did In the Midnight Hour and I Feel Good by James Brown. On the cover they did for I Feel Good, I Got You, Roger Taylor got to play the vocals. Here is the song. In 1969, this quiet street in southwest London was privy to our rock undergraduate's darkest cohab secrets. If you ever seen with Nail and I, it was just like that. <laughs> it was a fairly bohemian setup. Uh, I think Roger, Brian, and Freddie were the sort of official incumbents, and there were a whole bunch of people, myself included, who were sort of floating population. <laughs> In 1969, both Roger Taylor and Freddie Mercury used to sell clothes in Kensington Market. There was one particular gig at uh, Imperial College, and we were just building up a little bit of buzz because some of the gigs had been getting good. And this gig really went well. Different from your average rock song, because uh, it's basically in 6 8 time, uh, which is basically waltz time. And it's all very sort of. It's a great time signature to play in. It rolls, it has a certain unstoppable rolling quality. Very rough demo of it, and I remember turning around to Brian and I said, What do you think of that? He, he looked at me and he said, You are joking, aren't you? And you are joking. And I said, no, no, Brian, I'm deadly serious. I'm, you know, it's, it's about a car and, you know, and, you know, somebody who's in love with it. He'll tell you it was written about someone else, you know, but we know the truth, don't we, Roger? And, uh, I mean, Roger was always into fast things, you know, fast cars, etc., etc. It's very tuneful, but, of course, the vocal is the thing. You know, the vocal is, is the song, and that's a very memorable piece of writing there. OK, it, it doesn't happen now, but in those days, a single had two sides to it. It's a piece of plastic, it's a piece of, piece of vinyl. On this side is a record which probably every radio station is going to play, if you're lucky. 
On the other side is a track which probably almost nobody is going to play and nobody's going to care about, but it's just on there because the record has two sides. <laughs> you know, it goes back years and years and years. Occasionally you'd have a double A side so people could play both sides, but normally it was nothing. Now, <laughs> what happens is when it comes to getting paid, the record royalties for writing the tracks are split 50-50 between the A side and the B side, which is clearly an unfair situation, but that's the way it was. So whoever got the B-side got a free bonus. He got a great, you know, wadge of money from nowhere. And um, there was always some kind of resentment would go on. The classic case, of course, as, as Roger will tell you himself, you know, is um, I'm in love with my car was with the B-side of Bohemian Rhapsody. So I'm in love with my car became one of the biggest earners in terms of a, of a song of all time. So we were all a bit like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it became a joke, you know, and uh, Roger probably got un unfairly victimised for it, but he enjoyed it, I think. I think he enjoyed spending the money. You had Gaga, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. How did it come to you? What was it all about? Um, well, it sort of started in a way that my son, who was in Los Angeles, and he's, only, he's only three, and uh, turned on the radio one day, he went, oh, Radio Poo Poo, and then <laughs> turned into Radio Gaga, because I thought nobody would ever play it if we called it that. Um, and that was it, really. And then I had a sort of riff and, a, and a, a rather unusual chord sequence. And it all came together one Sunday afternoon in Los Angeles at home. How on earth do you write a song for Queen and then write a song for Roger Taylor? Is there a different process? No, there's no real process. I mean, it's just that it's easier to write songs for yourself. And I've never really been a particularly commercial writer, not a writer of singles. And I suppose my stuff is a bit more personal to me. Let's get uh, firmly up to the future. One vision now. All four members of the band have written this, right? Yes. Is that like four visions? Yes, four visions, which is uh, rare in that uh, you're often writing different sorts of pairs. I mean, how do four people get together to write a song? Um, well, in our case, with great difficulty. <laughs> um, because we're all sort of in different places quite a lot. And, I don't know, it, it, was, it was a real headache to make this one. And it, I think we decided we're never going to write to actually as sort of cool everything in one song again. I think it's usually better if one person writes the song and then the rest chip in their ideas. Do you about Martin Luther King? And um, now I don't know, I haven't got a clue what it's about. <laughs> Somebody said it was about Bob Geldof, but I don't think it is. No. So you don't know what it's about, but it's... No, not anymore. Really? Well, they changed all my words. Who did? It's like that rotter Freddy. <laughs> Roger's track, which is magic, I mean, he, he, he did it in a totally different way, but I just felt that there was another commercial streak, and I just realized that he was going away uh, to L.A. for about a week, so I just got hold of it, and I just changed it around completely, and when he came back, I said, well, what do you think? And he said, oh, I like it. I was just literally sitting at home, and I think I was in a rather reflective mood, and I did know that Freddie was ill, and I think it sort of came out of that slightly melancholic mood that one gets occasionally and uh, I, I guess I was just sort of trying to put an optimistic slant on it in a way. Roger started off writing These Are The Days Of Our Lives about his kids and the way he felt about life and how it comes back. Um, but of course, in that context, it had another meaning. Solos were, were a cliche in the early 70s they were a cliche so um and it was just something that one did you know and uh, i i never really honestly enjoyed actual solos i always really preferred playing as part of the ensemble part of the band and part of the song really and uh whereas it's all very nice to sort of show they're just showing off really aren't they you know and especially when you're playing to a lot of people in big concerts um you know if I, if I did a sort of solo and I would suddenly look down and notice people going out for a hot dog, I'd never want to do it again. Because you knew that you were boring people. Never affected Brian, but... You know. <laughs> Love. Hate. Love. Oats. Uh, mountains. Uh, and... Ladies, hate, hate very religious people. Uh, let me think, difficult. Uh, 
Um, I don't like politicians very much. Um, it's difficult, this. I don't like bigotry, I think, like, um, be it racism or... I hate, I think nationalism. Let's say nationalism. I don't like religion, it tends to fuck people up. <laughs> real religion! I mean, that must be something kind of off the wall about meeting royalty, especially if you're British. Well, it's just people, isn't it, really? Yeah. I, I suppose you're right. Actually, I was quite nervous last year when we met um, Charles and Diana. And, um, yes, it was quite nerve-wracking because everybody was in a row and I was next to David Bowie. And we, and we were both really nervous and he smoked about a pack of my marbles. And we were right at the end as well, because we had to wait while they sort of came and the camera was there and all that. And it was a bit nerve-wracking, yeah. It was a bit, it was very weird. Is she beautiful? Yeah, I mean, she's a, she's a girl, you know. <laughs> Roger's been working very closely with The Cross, with your band The Cross. Yes, yeah, so it, it, that was really when we decided to, to take a bit of a pause. Um, I thought I'd like to, to get involved with a, another band, but in a different capacity. So I'm, I'm the sort of singer of The Cross. And it's actually that they're developing now into a very much democratic group. But, um, of course, always, you know, Queen does take priority over everything which is why it was nice to get back in the studio again and make an album with the, uh, the four old... Uh, <laughs> men. Men. Four old hags that we call Queen, yes. <laughs> you're, you're this is the BBC, isn't it? I can't tell. <laughs> you're opening... Uh, I like you're Brian opening. calling us a bunch of comics just now. Yes, yeah, I mean, I've, with, I've with sort of played with the yeah. cross and I really do enjoy that. That's a real outlet for me and, and it's also different. As I say, I'm not the drummer in, in that band. So that's very interesting. I mean, I can, I can live with that. And, uh, you know, everybody has their own way of thinking. We've always done things that, that we've all wanted to do. And we can't, you know, possibly go on tour if one of us isn't keen. It, wouldn't, it would be as cheating, really. So, there, there we go, you know. So what, what about future projects for you, Roger? Anything coming up? Yes, I hope to do another cross record at some point. Um, it's, I'm not sure exactly when. And uh, we'll, we'll see what happens there. But in the meantime, you know, I hope that this Queen record is well accepted. And... Uh, It'll be interesting. This is a very funny stage. We've just finished the record. Mm. And so we don't really know. We're a little bit shell-shocked, you know. We've been in the studio for a year. And uh, so it's probably not the best time to sort of ask us because we've got no retrospect on it. Mm. No perspective on, on it. So why did you decide to go solo again after three records with the Cross? Uh, because I think the Cross had had its day. I think it had its time. And it's... Uh, and it was too a bit too tired. It was never really a big success, so and I didn't really want to uh, expend any more energy trying to make it a success. And um, I enjoyed my time with it, and I thought that was time. I could call it a day. I, I had like, an interview with Brian a couple of weeks ago, and he was on the road, and he said that you have made a complete mistake with the cross. You would, you would have done it completely different because you had like four guys from the street. Yeah. And then if, you were, if, if he was in your position as he's doing it now, you would have picked up the best and the well-known musicians to go on the road. Yes, but there was a different idea, you see, a completely different idea. I didn't want to pick up musicians who'd been in a hundred bands. I wanted something fresh. Uh, I'm not making any comment about Brian's band. And also, Brian launched his thing at a time when uh, Freddie died. So I would say there's no comparison at all. There is, you know, there's no parallel. And um, I don't really think I want to hear any comments that Brian has to make. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I understand these comments. So this is a, it, it seems like uh, there is no chance for any... any Shame he didn't tell me then, actually, <laughs> if he's the fucking expert. <laughs> And uh, I think that, that there is no chance that Queen will go on the road again, especially if Brian is... is I wouldn't just rule it out. Yeah. I wouldn't rule it out. I'm serious about that. Um, I think we're actually now coming to the point where Queen will be going again. Because I think 
we're, uh, you know, and we have to look at things in a very new way. And I think, you know, we're, we'll never get over Freddie, but I think the period of mourning is past, and it's time for a new leaf and a fresh look at it. And John and I will definitely be carrying things on, with or without Brian. That's up to him. So, would it be if, if Brian is joining the new Queen again, is there to be any other members, or would it still be three members? I'm not sure. I don't know. No, no.